Dr. Rob, I know you don't like the powder blues, but I was down in the heart of Mississippi this past week. You, you can't do a southern drawl to save your life. And I was in Lane Kiffin territory, and I had to get the powder blue come to the sip shirt. I like see, I like the powder blue. I can't it's UCLA I can't stand. Yeah. Right. I always thought I hated powder blue, but it's not that I hate powder blue. I like powder blue. I can't stand UCLA. I went to Oxford, one, because my daughter works at the University of Mississippi, and two, to get a Come to the Sip shirt, because I've seen Lane Kiffin. That's it. That's the only reason. Well, my my (laughs) daughter's boyfriend graduated from Ole Miss. Okay. and There was uh, stuff going on. There was stuff going on, but I had my sole purpose, and I went to Rebel Rags. Rebel Rags is the, is the, the store, and it's massive. I love Scotty's Drunk from Husker Hounds. You could take his stores combined, and it would not be the square footage of Rebel Rags. It is unbelievable. That's a that's a lot of powder blue. It's a lot of powder blue. A lot of Ole Miss. I'm sure there's like Manning jerseys all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, our guest today has been to Mississippi one time or another, uh, and we're going to talk JUCO football today. We we don't talk much JUCO football today. We probably should. And, and it, people in Nebraska may not be aware of this, but uh, one of the best. Well, right now, the best. Junior college football program in America is located in Council Bluffs. It's Iowa Western. And Scott Strohmeyer, the head coach of the Iowa Western Reavers. If you wonder what a Reaver is, it's it's pirate, right? Yep, river pirate. A river pirate. I like that. A river pirate. Not just a pirate. It's a river (laughs) pirate. I'm thinking of Matt Damon and was it The Martian where he's like, space pirates. (laughs) River pirate. I like it. Okay, I got to be honest. I did not. I mean, I kind of figured it was some kind of raider or pirate, something yeah. like that. I can't say he was a river pirate. I bet there are still river pirates out there. Ever seen Deliverance? I think there's some river pirates in Deliverance. <laughs> are they in Iowa, or do you think they're in Mississippi? I think you, on the Missouri I'm side, thinking, I think they're Missis- in Missouri. I think they're in Mississippi. And I think they're in Mississippi. And probably a little Louisiana, too, right? Once you get down there, it's it, it gets a little weird, a little sketchy, a little, little sketchy, a little sketchy. Welcome to the basement. When I when I reached out to you, you probably had no idea you were going to be in some dude's basement. On <laughs> I, Saturday I didn't. Morning. I didn't. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of a little scary sometimes. So it's like, hey, do you want to come hang out in my basement? We'll be drinking. <laughs> well, you know, I, I told my wife, I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do some podcast, and she's like, Where is it at? I said, uh, It's in some dude's basement. <laughs> and she's like, Give me that address in case you don't make it home. Leave, leave your phone on. I'm gonna have the, have the where's my iPhone app going 100 percent of the time? You know, you start. Believe it or not, Iowa Western has had football since 2009. You started the program. You've won two national titles. You have what over 130 wins. I'm going to ask you just point blank: What the hell are you still doing at Iowa Western? <laughs> I get it. I get it quite a bit. You know, I think <clears throat> number one, we like it here. Um, our administration's been really, really supportive. Uh, had some opportunities, but, and now my kids are 20, 17 and 14 and three girls. Um, not very easy. I had an opportunity, uh, at Iowa state when Matt Campbell came. And so we were going to play in a bowl game and we stopped at Iowa state and my daughters, when they were growing up, they'd always come on a trip with me. So Anna, my, my 17 year old, she comes on the trip <clears throat> And uh, we practiced there, and she's it, it, like taking pictures of Iowa State, and I knew it was maybe coming, right? So I'm thinking, okay, she might want to move. Well, then I, we're, we get back from the bowl game, and we're in Dick's Sporting Goods, and I'm like, look, Anna, Iowa State t-shirt. I'm like, would you, would you love to move there? And she's like, no way. I'm like, okay, we probably <laughs> <laughs> answers that. Ames no. Council Bluffs. Ames yeah. Council Bluffs. I, I, I might take Council Bluffs over Ames, yeah. actually. So, it, you know. was, God, it, why no. do you hate Iowa State? I don't. Well, my wife went, Your to, wife my, went my to school wife, there. I know that. My wife Trev's said I was a big. huge Hawkeye hater. Yeah, that's me. Massive Husker <laughs> fan. Yeah. Now we know he hates <laughs> Iowa State, too, apparently. <laughs> Rob likes to get his digs in whenever yeah. he can. Help me out remember something, because I remember when the program was formed. Uh, I was working at Channel 3 in Omaha at the time. And I remember talking to Dr. Dan Kinney, who was the president. Oh, this was all coming together. And if I'm totally wrong here, help me out. But did Tom Osborne do some consulting and help get Iowa Western football on the map? Yeah, so I, I know they met with them a lot, a lot um, to kind of you know what what should we be looking for in our first head coach and you know just questions about just starting the program. And then he 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 wasn't in the interview process because he became the AD, so he had to step away 
um, to help the pro, you know, oh, that's because right. now it's uh, NCAA with, you know, him being the AD at Nebraska, helping a junior college consulting. So, um, but he, he, he was spoke at our first uh, 2012 national championship ring ceremony. He came. Is that right? He said, I still remember. He said, uh, it was in year four that we won it. And he goes, he looks over at me and he's like, we went 12 and 0. And he's like, just so you know, coach, this is what they're going to expect every year now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Even at, even at the junior college level, it's that way, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It is. You know, our, it, and all the sports at Iowa Western have been really good. I, I think we won a soccer national championship. Uh, I think this weekend we got three or four track athletes that won national individual national championships. Um, you know, it, it's just been, they, they do it the right way, I think. And everybody thinks that we just have unlimited cash flow, you know, cash for our programs. And we do have unbelievable facilities, but it's not like it's just an open checkbook, you know. And <clears throat> But the thing is, is the school understands what athletics can bring to an institution. And I think you want to talk about why I'm, I'm still here. I mean, that's a big one. I've been at places where athletics weren't that important. That, that's wisdom for any school, though. Yeah. Any school is going to be like that. I, I mean, I would think. I mean, I that's something that I mean we've often preached is that I mean to a degree the t- I mean Travis, you and I have talked about that in regards to Ole Miss and your daughter's experience working at administration down at Ole Miss. Well, I'll use this as a perfect example, and I, I'm sure you visited with Lane Kiffin because when you saw the shirt, you knew exactly what I was wearing. That when my daughter started Ole Miss four years ago, she's the director of marketing for student housing. They had two dorms, two dorms on campus that were empty. They were empty. Yeah. Lane Kiffin comes in now. They are officially on a waiting list. They can't, and they keep accepting everybody, but because of Lane Kiffin and his success in football, they they can't fill, the dorms are full, and they don't know where to put some people. It's crazy. What, what, what was do. the one in the <clears throat> the NCAA tournament? Uh, the jo- There was a Florida school, and they're, uh, it, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like real, for, well, it could have been Ford Atlantic that just went what to the final four to the Elite Eight. This has been a while ago. Oh, you're talking about? I North, think it's Florida International. It might FIU. be FIU, whose coach is now at USC because he had the they were dunking all over the place and they pulled off the first round upset. And they said something like they're after the NCAA tournament, their enrollment applications went up a hundred and some percent. Well, let me ask you this because I'm, I'm a Western Iowa kid. I grew up in Minden. I went to Tri Center, Neola. When when I was growing up, I, I mean, I Western had baseball and I think it had a little basketball, right? Yep. yep. But it, I took a summer class. I went to Grandview and Des Moines. I took a summer class at Iowa Western, but it was never really an option. I see more people now, maybe because of affordability. That's a good reason for it. But what has athletics done for Iowa Western as far as enrollment goes? Well, when they started, fo- so Dr. Kinney wanted football really bad. Well, he, the board, he had to convince the board. So our male enrollment was down, like it was like, like 52 to, I don't know, whatever. The, the male enrollment was declining. So they did some, he did some research and every school that had football, their male enrollment was up. So that's how he presented to the board. So the board then approves it. That's how we can increase our male enrollment. And then the rule of thumb when you started was for every football player you sign, it brings two people from that they know or their school. <clears throat> now our enrollment has declined a little bit, you know, and I think it is across the country at every school, not just us. Not we, we aren't hitting it as much because when I got here, they were building dorms, they were built or building suites. It was nonstop, and we we had waiting lists. And now we, I mean, we're getting them filled, but the enrollment's just declining. But I think that's you know the the I did, I do think it's helped, and then. When we won it in 12, and then all those guys that went on, the Jake Waters who goes to K-State and, and has an unbelievable run and we're watching them you know, play you know, in bowl games and things, how many times they said Jake Waters, NJCA Offensive Player of the Year, uh, won a national championship at Iowa Western was said, and not just him, I mean other players too. And he's like, there's no price tag we could have put on marketing for our school than what that that group of guys did. Interesting. I, I, we, we're going to go all over the place today. We'll, we'll, we'll get to Nebraska and Matt Rule and either former Husker coaches who you had to deal with. I, I, there is not one junior college football program in the state of Nebraska. Why? Why is that? I don't know. I think. I, I think there is some. 
fear, you know, cause it, cause it is of, I mean, it, it is an investment. I do think, um, but I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure why, uh, somebody wouldn't start one, I guess, where would you play? How many teams, you know, cause it's hard if you're, when Kansas dropped us two years ago or prior to COVID, they dropped our, our contract with them for two years. It was tough. I mean, I, I had to travel to Georgia, travel to Utah. Oh, you mean the Kansas, the, the Jayhawk League, that yeah. which which is okay. Hutchison and Dodge City and Independence, that whole so thing. So, do I mean do leagues form partnerships like that at, at the junior college level? I mean, when you said Kansas dropped us, was it almost like a full league type of thing? Yeah. So, when when I Western started football in two thousand nine or two thousand eight, um, we didn't play till nine. We were the tenth team in our conference. Okay. There's four that still play football. Wow. So all of them in Illinois dropped. And it was that time at Nyack where I came from dropped the year before we started. So they dropped in 2000. At Mason City? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> then Rock Valley dropped. Then College du- or, uh, Joliet Junior College dropped. Well, then his son or his brother was the president at Grand Rapids Community College in Michigan. They dropped. Then Harper dropped. And so the only one in Illinois left is DuPage. And then North Dakota School of Science joined the Minnesota League. So we were left with three teams, us, Iowa Central, and Ellsworth. And so we were trying, we had to play each other twice, and I didn't like that. You know, I, <clears throat> I wanted to go play some teams. And then, so then in 2014, we made an agreement with the Jayhawk Conference in Kansas that our three teams would, we're not joining the conference, but we'll play everybody and you guys get three more games. And so that's when it kind of started. And then COVID came and, and, and well, hell with realignment in college football, did it just make sense for you guys to join the league? <laughs> yes. Well, the biggest thing was, was they didn't want to change the, the Jayhawk conference name, you know, and with Iowa. So were we going to, you know, just join it and be in the Jayhawk <clears throat> or they didn't want, I don't know. It, it, it was a whole discussion. One, I don't think they want Iowa Western in that conference. Well, because you guys yeah, keep what? winning. <laughs> it's like, <what? laughs> well, I mean, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, it, junior college football probably hit its peak. I mean, as far as popularity across the country with last chance you yep. right yep. and let's start with let's start with east mississippi and buddy stevens do you know buddy stevens very well i do and how much of that was an act and how much of it is really buddy stevens <sighs> i think buddy's i think that was buddy stevens um i act buddy's grown on me like at first when i watched the show and because we played them in 2014, they beat us in the national championship game. And then last chance, you was their 15 and 16. Oh. So there was a couple clips of them with their national championship. With and it, there was a, a clip of Iowa Western when they beat us down there. And when I, Buddy is hated because he's so good, and he don't he don't care. You know what I mean? So um, he's kind of grown on me a little bit. Uh, we talk quite frequently. I mean, really? he'll call me and you know, um, and ask some questions about some different things. But uh, you know, I he he did tell me, and, and he might be a BS or two. I don't know him that well, but he did tell me. He goes, "I I learned a lot from the show of seeing myself." I could see that. Okay, that's kind of interesting. You no. Know? little in, introspective you yeah. know you look at yourself and go oh am i really that way yeah although what you say about him growing on you like that i mean there's some people for which that works i mean i, I mean you've got lane kiffins and Deion sanders of the world out there coaching and i mean buddy stevens is he's buddy stevens <laughs> I mean, it's, if, I've, I've watched i have gone because you were the one who told me it's like dude you got to go watch this. yes I went and watched it, and it is one of those like, yeah, this guy's something else. I mean, he he's kind of singular in in and of that world. But I mean, there's ways. I mean, you've talked about with like Deion Sanders, where you're like, well, Coach Prime, and it, you're like, God, in a way, it kind of works for him. I mean, he's always been that way, and it kind of works. I was gonna say, has Dion really ever wavered from his brand? No, no. And I don't think I don't think a guy like I mean, in terms of having that brand, I don't think a guy like Lane Kiffin has either. And I think a guy like Buddy Stevens, if he tries to change himself, and he's gonna, 
he's going to like dial it down to where he's no longer Buddy Stevens. That's not going to work. Right. And I don't think he's going to have the, he wouldn't have the success that he has had. It's funny this year. So every year or every, now they're moving forward with the voting polls. So every region gets a coach on the poll. Me, I was the region 11. Buddy Stevens was Mississippi's. We're down at the Walter Jones Award. We had our D end, uh, Jackson Filer, was up for the basically the Juco Heisman. <laughs> and uh, I'm with the, the Jones, Mississippi head coach, because his, his running back was down there. And we we're getting the last, I had the last poll call. And Jones dropped, and East Mississippi went up, and they beat East Mississippi. And he just went off on Buddy Stevens, like he's tr- screwing us, this and that, and and uh, and Buddy knows it, so he, I mean, he calls him out on it. And and Buddy actually did a really good job in those. Like be, he he would sit on there, and he's like, guys, I got to be careful because I'm gonna get, gonna get attacked by everybody if this happens. You know, a guy like this team's ahead of this team or whatever. How does JUCO work? Because you know California has its own league. We learned that through Last Chance U as well. I don't think a lot of people. How does junior college work? California has its own league. Are they the only one? Or so it's it's Division One NGCAA. Or yep. I think I'm getting it right. And then California has its own league. Yep. yep. Do you like that? I mean, <clears throat> I would love to have California play uh, with us, but. When when the the Arizona League dropped a few years ago, so there's no JUCOs in Arizona anymore. Wow. Um, now it's really just Texas. There's one in New Mexico that plays in Texas, the Mississippi, Kansas, us, Snow College is left alone in in Utah, and then there's some out east that are more like Division Lackawanna in Pennsylvania, and a couple in New York. The Miami one dropped. The the Brooklyn, New York one dropped. And Missis, or Minnesota has like seven teams or something left. There's not a lot out there. Wow. I And, and that kind of surprised me a little bit because JUCOs is still – it's still – it's not last chance you. I mean, that, that's a great name for a show, but it does provide a lot of opportunity. And I'm sure you've seen guys come in going, they're never going to make it, and then they had a being a Division One player, you're like, wow, there, there's so much development. That t- and, Rob, you saw it with guys you played with starting as a freshman and, and walk-ons that came in like, you're never going to play. But then over time, yeah. you Three years later. Yeah. Um, well, and I that was going to be my question for is like, do you see – okay, total tangent here. We're going from sort of the organizational structure of junior college football in America to – We chase rabbits here. We, we do. Yeah. <laughs> um, Talent evaluation in and of itself. I mean, and, and I guess I, I at some point I want to kind of circle back around to like, how do you guys recruit? What is the methodology there? But my question was, is that, I mean, when you see some of these guys come in, it's I, I would assume there's probably a portion of these guys who are just – they're probably not very good, but they just love playing the sports. Like, hey, here's an opportunity to keep playing for a couple more years. Yep. I would assume there's those guys, and those guys themselves, I think, kind of know who they are. I think they're pretty self aware. I, I mean, how many of these guys do you look at that come in percentage wise out of the total number of guys on a on a team that you're looking at and you're you're making that assessment? Yeah, this guy, you know, and if he just if he does this for a couple of years, I think he's going to keep a playing. He's going to go on to play somewhere after junior college versus the guy you're looking at going like, I know this guy loves the sport. I know he wants to keep playing. No way in hell. Yeah. Because I would, I mean, the thing, so I've got a son who plays D2 football. And even that, that's kind of, I always, even he will tell you that was like going D2 was kind of a moonshot for him coming out of high school. One year starter. He was on a good team with some very good linemen. Um, so for him to get to that level was, was kind of a pretty cool accomplishment, yeah. I thought. But, I mean, we looked at a lot of small schools, NAIA schools, D3 schools, small handful of D2 schools. Man, when it comes to quality of football, those guys aren't messing around. It's yeah. There's good football. And I see some of the guys going to Iowa Central. Some of my son's teammates have gone to Iowa Central and Iowa Western, people he's played played against. And it's there, there's some really, really good football at that level. 
what percentage of these guys are you looking at going like, all right, you can be on the team, but it's probably you're not going to play that much longer. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I think you know we play we play a JV schedule too, so like we we're only allowed to play forty guys outside of the state of Iowa. So now twenty of them have to be from border states. So prior to like when I first started, we only got twenty. And so it was a little bit challenging, even in some, even in Omaha, where maybe it took a while. I maybe ruffled some feathers with some coaches because I didn't, I could only take a division one caliber athlete when we first started. Well, now when we go 40 out of staters, 20 of them have to be, but I can go over 20 for border states. Now we're taking the, the division two recruited type kid that is going to probably the best thing was was prior to uh coach frost so it'd been after bo plea mike riley's time yeah when kind of the walk-on program kind of was it was fizzling yes we loaded up like that's when really that's when we won over some coaches in nebraska the saying dang he's got division two offers he's got fcs offers but if he goes there for two years he can maybe go. All of a sudden, that's maybe a D1 kid. <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, we do. We have some guys that we I tell them, like, you're going to start off on JV or playing JV games. You're still on the varsity squad, but you got to get some film. Shoot, we played an NAI school uh, in Nebraska this year, and I think they offered eight of our guys after the JV game. Who was that? You know, Doan. Okay. And so we play Doan. We play we we haven't played Midland in a couple of years. We play Morningside. We play Grandview. You know, try to get these guys some opportunities because they're all they 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 need players too. And and I've had some go to Grandview who played on national championship at Grandview. Coach Woodley's a good dude. He's a great guy. Joe's you know? a good dude. And and they they were marginal players for us, you know, role players. And they go there and they're really successful. You know, so that's the the thing is. So we do take a lot of those guys and, um, but doing it for so long now, you kind of get like. You know, I use the example. We had a D lineman. He's six six, three hundred pounds. Right? He don't move like a D lineman. He's an O lineman. He did not want to move though. I'm like, do you want to play? Because if you want to play Zach Division Potter one, all over again, <laughs> if you want to play <laughs> Division yeah, I was, One, I was an O lineman, and I see a lot of guys where I look, and it's like, you're not an O lineman. Yeah. You're a D lineman, or you see a D kid is like you're not a D lineman. You are an offensive lineman, and and it's kind of funny because I think if you're around the sport enough, you see that you're a D. You are definitely a defensive player. You've got no future on offense, despite the fact you want to catch touchdown passes, and and the exact opposite. So when you say that, I I, I get what you mean. What you mean there? Well, and oh, doing it for so long, I know what coaches are going to look for. Like, <clears throat> you know. I just moved a wide receiver who's a 6'6", 6'5", 200, he was 205 pounds. Below average, he'll be a D2 NAI player as a wide receiver. He's got a chance to play FCS or Division One if you make a commitment, put on some weight and play tight end. Because now he's an athletic tight end before he was a, you call it possession wide receiver, you know. And <clears throat> so you got to see just over the years of what these schools are going to be looking for, you know, to try to help them put them in position. You know, you brought up recruiting, I, and I honest question because you always hear this, and I want to know if it actually happens. Do Division One, like let's say Nebraska, Iowa, Iowa State, they have a guy may not making grades, whatever. Do they help Funnel. you in recruiting? Do they place people with you? the The placing of players has gone down. Why is that? I don't. Well, one, I think. Uh, they don't, like, it depends because they, they want to recruit other JUCOs. And so, like, there's, so Iowa State, I mean, if there's a kid in Iowa or that one of the in state schools are recruiting, like, they're going to tell me. Now, there's a couple times where they can be like, hey, well, this is a really good spot. And then we could get them, you know, and, and they both placed players with me. <clears throat> but it's not as much anymore that of saying, as it used to be, it used to be a, like. It, do you think exposure? I mean, in terms of, I guess exposure is the word I'm thinking of. But I mean, kids now, it's, you can't hide a kid somewhere. And I say placed, I use the word hide a little bit because I remember 
back in the 70s and 80s, there was sort of this oh, yeah. thing where Nebraska would like, hey, we're gonna sh- we're gonna send you to down to uh, Coffeeville, Coffeeville for a year or two <laughs> and then pull you back up. And did Michael Bishop go to Coffeeville? He went or no, to he was Blinn. Blinn. He was Blinn, Blinn, wasn't he? Okay, yeah. But I and I, I guess the thing is now whether or not a an FCS or D1 school is trying to hide a kid per se. I, I would think in terms of exposure, in terms of a, of a high school kid being able to market themselves, because you can't pull up a high school kid's Twitter profile without seeing right there in the bio, yeah. high weight, 40 time, high jump, and what their stats yeah. were on the basketball team. It's all right there now, and everybody's sending out huddle film and everything else, that there's not a lot of, I would think, the hidden gems anymore that maybe just need a year of experience or a the hidden kid who nobody knows about, but you just got to work on the academics for a yep. year. And once he gets that done, he's going to be a D one kid. That doesn't really exist anymore. Everybody knows everything about all of these kids. And if there's an opportunity for them, I, I see a school, somebody like a really good NAIA program or a good FCS program, somebody like that coming in and sweeping some of these kids up. Yeah, uh, well, so Davion Nixon, who went to Iowa, Iowa placed him with us. Okay, he was out of Wisconsin. We knew about him. We knew his grades. But now since they dropped the ACT for most schools, there's not a lot of kids that have to go JUCO anymore. Oh, You know yeah. what I mean? So they – because you can, you can help your GPA with credit recovery – a lot easier than you can go from a 14 ACT to a 19 ACT, you know? So a lot of schools aren't requiring the ACT anymore. So that, <clears throat> that changes the landscape of junior college. But so in Davion's case, so he was placed here. Which I still, that one still stings looking at him. Cause I remember he, when he was with you guys, who was just one of those like, God, this guy's just killing it up there. And like, God damn it. And he's going to Iowa. <laughs> So <laughs> that one sucked. You know, he was pl- so the the crazy, the toughest thing now is so so he was placed whatever three years ago, four years ago, and all of a sudden he's having a good year. Now all of a sudden, Alabama comes in, and this other school comes in. And I met with his dad after one of our games. I'm like, "You're going to tell me now you're interested in Alabama? They came in yesterday." And, and you have a relationship with this school that stuck with you for so long. Like, let's not just chase it. Like, you you still have a relationship. Because we're getting close to signing day. You know I mean? We got maybe four days to go, and he's going to go sight unseen to Bama because it's Bama. So he ended up staying, obviously, with Iowa. But that puts you between a rock and a hard yes, place. Yes. Because, because you, you have to be like Switzerland, right? Yeah. In, in the fact that, yeah, Iowa places him with you. Mm-hmm. But you can't keep Nick Saban from coming to Council Bluffs. Not and going, anymore. You can't. <laughs> so, like, we sent a prospect list, and and we like I won't put him on the list if he was a place player back in the day, right? Well, now, like I said, they these kids are posting their highlights. Well, they've been everybody knows everybody. Th- yes, yeah. and they've been following each other throughout the recruiting season and things on Twitter, and so there's a coach. It's crazy that we're talking about this because there's a school. It's a group of five school. I won't name it, um, but there's a coach there that was at Indiana, and okay, Kevin Wilson. Yes, no. it, not <laughs> it wasn't him. <laughs> he he was there though. And uh, so, anyways, um, there was a wide receiver, Taj Williams, was committed to Indiana. He didn't make this in 2014. He ended up going to TCU, but so he committed to Indiana. He's not going to make the grades, and. They call us, they call two other junior colleges, and we got to recruit the kid, right? So we recruit him, we win out. He comes, plays for us, he's All-American. He don't want to go to Indiana because he's getting all these other schools. So I'm sitting there, I'm like... Which you can't blame because Indiana right. is not that great a no, football exactly. program. Exactly, and and then it wasn't. Right? I mean, they're, more, they're better yeah. today than they were then. I said, you need to call Indiana... And you need to tell them that you're not interested or you're going to reopen your recruitment. Well, that coach that claims he placed him with us, there's a receiver right now that is committed to the school that he's at, and they're trying to place him at another school and not Iowa Western because they felt that we 
backdoored and got him to TCU. But see, they got to know that that puts you between a rock and a hard place. They, they, because you can't sit there for two years saying, you're going to Indiana, you're going to Indiana, you're going to TCU, you're going to Iowa, going to Nebraska. Well, you it, can't do that. And I wouldn't think it was, it's your job, especially in this day and age of kids, I mean, with transfer portal, I mean, at the D, at all levels, kids are bouncing all over yeah. the place. I would think that, I mean, a halfway intelligent four-year institution coach would look at you and be able to realize it's not your job yes. to recruit these kids for that school. Yeah. Well, and and the thing is, like when when it was pretty heavy doing that, I would I would be on a call, a three way call with the four year school, the kid, the kid's parents, and myself or whatever, and we're saying, okay, just so you know, your son's going back to, you know, this school once he graduates. So at least they know that we're on the same page. Does it always work that way? It doesn't. And most coaches, they know like this can happen, especially nowadays with like the way these kids can get exposure. Which brings us back to where we started with Tom Osborne helping Dr. Dan Kenny get the program off the ground. You mentioned he's, t- he's talked at your banquet for the 2012 National Championship. What has been your relationship with Nebraska coaches? How many players have you put at Nebraska? And I, I know it puts you between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> well, and, when, and, when you ask this, when, when Travis, when you're asking this question, the clarification I would put on it, we're not talking about Nebraska in general. We're talking about the coaches who've been who've at Who've been there. Nebraska. So you, you've been with Bo Pelini. You've been with Mike Riley. You've been with Scott Frost and now Matt Rule. First of all, has Matt Rule been to visit you yet? Not yet, but I've, I've had conversation. Okay. So take me through who you thought was good to work with, who maybe wasn't good to work with. And I know that puts you in a tough spot, but I mean, I think okay. people listen to this spot. But people Pelini's listen to this spot. Re- Pelini's retired from coach. Yes. I, I always got along great with Bo. I don't know him that well. But I got along with I, did, I, I got along with him great. Riley will never coach college again. God, I hope not. What a disaster. <laughs> and people don't care what you care, say about Scott. So. Yeah, so it, it's kind of one of those, you're in a safe place. <laughs> it's not like you're burning a bridge. <laughs> Who ever with, thought the basement was a safe place? Yeah, it's not like you're burning a bridge with Bo Pelini and Youngstown. It's, but but yeah, I think people want to know that because yes. we've watched – Really good players go play. I mean, yeah. Makai Sargent, there's a great running back that played for Iowa, right? I mean, maybe one of the best players you've ever had. I, I could be. Pretty, there's yeah. been a lot of guys that have come through Iowa Western where they're from a, from a, I'm a Nebraska football fan. I played there. I grew up in Lincoln. I've looked up at Iowa Western and gone like, why has there not been at least a little bit of a pipeline from you to Lincoln, that's the question. That's, yes. And like I said, you're not pissing anybody off because those other three guys are gone and Husker fans don't give a rat's ass about what you say about them. <laughs> so there's no bridges yeah. to burn here. Well, so Unless when, Frost becomes an O coordinator at Oregon or wherever right. someday. But here, but. So here's the deal. Everybody thought that it's going to be an easy pipeline, you know, because Nebraska has taken junior college kids in Tom Osborne's time and been. Really and, and it has been successful. I yes. mean, it's one of those. It's so easy to look at you guys and the success you've had and how early on from starting the program you've had that success. It, it seems like it would have been a natural fit. Yes. Yeah. So in, in in Bo Pelini's defense, you if 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 you, I'm at a four year school, I'm going to a junior college that I trust that I have a relationship with a coach, and and to be honest with you, all those guys that that were at Nebraska, the Levante Davids, the uh, um, they were all at Fort Scott with Jeff Sims. Gotcha. And so what people don't know is Bo. Carl, Jeff Sims, well, Jeff and Carl were coaching together at Mankato State and Ohio University, so they had the relationship there. So if there's a placed player, those guys are- It was at Fort Scott. Scott. Right? And which I knew that, but it took, it takes a little bit of time. Right, but like Bo's last year, and I can't remember the kid's name, but they did, um, the running backs coach, still there. Still there. Um uh... Off the field now. Oh, Ron Brown. Ron Brown. Okay. Yeah. So the last year, Ron Brown, there was a wide a running back from Texas that they they placed with us. Okay. Well, then 
it was whatever uh change of staff or whatever so never and the kid never panned out at our place but they never offered a player from Iowa Western in our time. Really? Bo never did. The, that staff never did. <clears throat> the first one was, so then Mike Riley comes in. Mike Riley, so I started building a relationship with his, his recruiting guy who's now the quarterback's coach, maybe offense corner at like San Jose. Uh, doesn't matter. I'm okay. blank, and that was like that whole staff yeah. under Riley. So I, I, I like so I reached out to him and I told him I'm like, listen, like I want to help you. I literally, when Taj Williams got offered by TCU, I called him. I said, hey, Taj just got offered by you know a big or TCU. So they started. They that was the first offer in 2015. 2014, maybe 14 or 15 was Taj Williams. That was the first offer from Nebraska. Think about this. They'd already won a national title, and you've had oh, okay. Keep going. That yeah. that that amazes yeah. me. So it, Taj it, was the first one that was offered, but and it was Mike. It was Riley's staff. Obviously, he went to TCU. So then it goes to um, Scott. I thought it was. A, I thought it was a lock, right? I mean, I know Scott. I had a good relationship with Scott. Uh, met him when he was at or and actually Northern Iowa to Oregon or what I know Eric Shenander extremely well um like I would consider him friends honestly and it just was never so when UCF or UCF Mike Hughes the the he was drafted in the first round the corner to the Minnesota Vikings he was at Garden City Community College okay it's a JUCO guy yes and so there was some, there was the one year that Maurice Washington, and then there was a big old lineman, and there was a wide receiver, and Maurice obviously made it, but the old lineman and the the wide receiver didn't, and they ended up going to Garden. And and the next year it didn't work out for them there. The next year I'm at practice, and Scott's like, if I ever have a kid, I'm not listening. To nobody else on staff. He's going to you, go, coming to you. <clears throat> And they, I mean, they offered Perry on Winfrey. Um, they offered, I thought they might have offered another one um, in the time. Obviously, Perry you know, got drafted, went to Oklahoma. So, I don't know. The The thing is, is we, we didn't, each staff's a little bit different. Like Devin Drew, he, he came there this year as a grad transfer from Texas Tech. Devin played for us. Devin was, I called those guys numerous times about Devin Drew. Devin Drew wasn't tall enough. Like then, and again, I, I get it as a coach, you have your little things. So, so, but the funny thing was Devin Drew's on a visit, right? They take a picture, Devin Drew and Eric Shenander's a good friend of mine, but takes a picture and I text him back. I'm like, did he grow any? He played two years at Texas Tech or has one more year or, you know what I mean? But they, they needed somebody then it's changed a little bit. You know, Makai Sargent was one. I, he just didn't have the breakaway is what they said. Geronimo Allison, who went to Illinois, who had a huge game winning touchdown in Lincoln. Was an offer. That was, that was an, that might've been Riley's area. So I'm going to ask you a question here because I think I hear what you're saying in your 14 years as head coach at Iowa Western. You have placed close to 400 Division One players. You have placed 85 plus in Power Five schools, and not one of your players has ever gone to Nebraska. No, that's mind blowing. I've had that's, an hour that's away. fucking unbelievable. It is the closest football playing JUCO wow. to Lincoln. You know, I and and the thing for me too, a little bit. <clears throat> Fucking goose egg! That's unbelievable. <laughs> what the hell? Which is, I mean, but I mean, Which, that's, and I, I'm not, I'm not, tr- we're not trying to put you on the spot. It's just, it, it's mind blowing to me, and, and it sounds like there's like, with each staff, there's different reasons yep. why, yep. and I understand that. But you've had five but national I'm, players of the year, right? Mm-hmm. You've won two national titles. I'm just Jake look, Waters is. I mean, here's a kid that goes to Kansas State. Yeah. Did they? Did that would have been Riley's time? 
That would have he was twelve. He was he was he a was Pelini 12, year. That was yeah. Pelini. Twelve. Yeah, would have been his senior or sophomore year. Kind yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm been. sitting here and I'm just I'm thinking of it in terms of having when you guys started the football program. The thought that went through my mind, especially with the really early success you had. In my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is an amazing resource for Nebraska. And then it's been a decade and a half of crickets chirping ever since. That's shocking to the, me. The, 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 the relationship with Nebraska yeah. is what I mean. I Mind really thought, me, I, and like I said, I, <clears throat> like Scott was the only head coach to come to Iowa Western, and he was there his first year on the job. Him and him and Eric Shenander both came, um, sat in my office, and so I mean, just because I think our pr- prior relationship, I really thought I was going to get going, and and again, like we've had some good players, so I'm not I don't want to throw them on the spot necessarily, but I think the thing that they look too much at there, there's some other things like if I can stamp a kid, like he may not, and and this isn't Scott's. Uh, staff, but when Mackay, or actually he was, it yeah, because I'm like, coach, I'm telling you, like the kid, is, he can play the best vision, strongest, uh, doesn't go down on first contact, the uh, great pass protector. Here's the deal, he's not going to run a four four forty, but I mean he ran for a few hundred yards in in a couple games at, at University of Iowa, and that was his only offer. Like so, it wasn't like. Sometimes those coaches get caught up in who else is offered. Like, does, is he's not a four star. We're not beating Ole Miss. We're not getting the the two four seven recruiting rankings. We're down. You know, I've even known some staffs in the not not Nebraska, but Division one coaches that after they offer a kid, they call the rivals or the two four seven and try to get them more stars because that helps them type of thing. Which, like, let's. You know, I mean, Jared Ebert went to Oregon in 2010, a D lineman. He was a zero star. He got offered by Oregon. He was a four star the next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Dude, I remember Trev Alberts has a great story about when he came out of Cedar, at, Cedar come, Falls. Yeah, came out of Cedar Falls, how there was a couple recruiting services that had him ranked like nobody did stars then, but he was like the. Down. Like the 114th ranked recruit in the state of Iowa. Because recruiting then, services are stupid. Well, yeah, and then when Nebraska offered them all of it, and I think it was Super Prep was the – was because they were recruiting me at the same time in Iowa was, as was Nebraska. So um, back then it was like rankings. It, it wasn't – you didn't have stars, and it was all snail mail paper, but – I remember like Trev was like the 114th ranked recruit in the state of Iowa. Nebraska offered him, and all of a sudden Trev's like the third ranked recruit in the state yeah. of Iowa yeah. just off of that one offer alone. Man, that, that, that's that's crazy. What's the what's the advantage of going to JUCO? I mean, when, when you look at all the NAI programs out right, I'm I'm a Grandview grad, right? Yep. So I Grandview didn't have football when I went to school there. That's how old I am, but. They've they've used football to grow the enrollment, but you have these options now. Is it because you can still develop, and it's easier to go to that Division One, Division Two route instead of the NAI well, route? Sometimes in the smaller schools, or, you know, in Iowa or Nebraska, they're playing multiple sports. They might be playing out of position um, because they're the bigger guy, and they could play something else. I always tell, I think the the biggest thing is is we well so shoot we have in fourteen years over seventy. And this is just Iowa kids because we had to, we have to recruit Iowa kids. Seventy Iowa high school players that had NAI or Division two offers out of high school that came to us and ended up playing FCS or FBS ball. That's development. I mean, so so it's just not a place to get your grades in line. It's a place to actually develop and find where you're supposed to play. Well, shoot, I mean, we we had a kid who came to us at six two and left at six four. Wow. Or he came in at uh, 240 pounds. Actually, well, Ontario Thompson, who just went to Iowa. Sorry, another one. D lineman. <laughs> God damn. He Zero, was, Rob. Zero. I know. He oh. was six foot three, two and a half, six foot three, 
260 pounds coming out of high school out of Davenport. <clears throat> and he didn't play his junior year. Nobody, nobody knew about the kid, right? His high school quarterback talked him into coming out a senior year. He came out still under, we seen him at some camp, not even a big name camp, just a, a workout facility, right? Athletic, we took him. COVID redshirted him. The kid's now 6'3", 300 pounds, will windmill dunk, backflip, like, and he's he's got three years to play it. He's a freak athlete. A freak. Wow. You know, so it so situations like that. You know, they the kids are going to get put themselves in position. They're going to grow. They're going to get bigger. You know. So we were talking about Scott Frost. You you mentioned you haven't met Matt Rule yet, but you've talked to people. Do you expect Matt Rule and his staff to be a, a little more? Progressive, should we say, than the previous staffs, or is it still Abs- too early? Absolutely. I mean, I think now, early on, here's the deal. I and and I I talked to Matt as soon, after he got the job. Um, we were still playing, and I gave him some names of our D lineman who's going to Auburn and our corner who's going to K State. It was just late in the game, right? Um, but they evaluated him. He, he knew about our program because one of his recruiting guys at Baylor is a good friend of ours. I was hoping he was going to come to Nebraska, but he's at Texas Tech now and he's doing really good. Likes it there. But so weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so CJ, um, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, is their, their player personnel or, or recruiting guy. I've known CJ for like 10 years. And so we, I, I went down for practice. 15, maybe 20 of my players drove down followed us down and they did an unbelievable job with this group right we got to see the new facility toured us in the new facility now obviously not done but they told us what it was um gave our players time all the coaches did uh i think they're doing a really good job at the end of the day it still has to be a need you know because i had a i had a uh um a redshirt freshman who came in? He came in last year. He redshirted for us, and because we had, we ended up sending four corners D one, two safe or one safety D one, and two other safeties FCS. So we redshirted them. I told my coaches, I said, "Listen, when we redshirted him, I said he ain't ever going to play a snap at Iowa Western." They're like, "What are you talking about? Someone's going to offer him after his, after spring ball, Florida State. He's committed to Florida State, so he's got four years to play at Florida State." But I called CJ, and he's like, "We're full right now at that position," which and and the, and he Ashlyn was one that went down there. So sometimes it's a timing thing too. You know what I mean? He's as good as any freshman that they or high school kid that they could have found, right? Um, and he's gonna he'll blow up. But it just at some it, point it becomes a numbers game. Yes, it does. It See, does. Rob's not upset about that because his daughter goes to school at Florida State, so he's uh, he's a Seminole at heart we're too. Like a, we're like a total like our whole household. We're all closed. Speaking of that, is she graduating? Uh, switch majors. Oh, she did that had to get all, another year, didn't she? Yeah. So she had all the required <laughs> class. Well, both my wife and I are like. Yeah, we kind of dig visiting you. If something like <laughs> you got to stick around for an extra semester or two, we're kind of cool with that. So. I'll tell you what. So I, Mike Norvell is unbelievable. It's been fun watching him. He's 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 a great guy. I know him really well. And then a guy that worked with me, J.C. Krause, is in his recruiting, okay. yep. his recruiting staff. What's it like? I You may or may not remember this. I was up at uh, Prairie Meadows, I think, about three years ago. It was for the Iowa. Yeah. We, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, yeah, and I do yes. a show in Des Moines, so I interviewed you. But I, I was fun to watch because Kirk Ferentz is there, Matt Campbell is there. What I mean, they were just kissing your ass. I mean, it's fun <laughs> to watch these head coaches because they were like, I mean, Matt was vying for time, Kirk was vying for time. I mean, if I were to hang out, you're located fairly close to the to the Council Bluffs Airport. If I were to hang out there, would I see a lot of would we see a lot of planes flying in to go to your office? Oh yeah, I mean it was it's been <clears throat> now COVID. And then the next year portal opened, it slowed. It was it was really JUCO recruiting was really down because people would go after like they said the portal. Prior to that though, there was one spring game 
where I, I, we were joking around, but uh, we weren't in our new facility yet. It was like the National Coaches Convention. I mean, there's 50 coaches there. Head coaches or just all assistant coaches? Mostly assistant coaches then in the evaluation period. When they offer, I mean, Lincoln Riley, Gary Patterson, uh, Sam Pittman, Brett Bielema, I mean, all those guys, when they offer a kid and they, they're coming in right before signing day to make sure and lock the deal up. Lane Kiffin was there. Funny story about Lane. <clears throat> so Lane, you either love him or you hate him. I, yeah, I would agree <laughs> with that. Okay? So I love him. And a couple of my coaches didn't like him. So he's in there, and he had his uh, Starbucks coffee cup, and it, it's, it sat there. I kept it. I wouldn't throw it away. <laughs> that was Lane Kiffin's cup. I came in one day, and someone threw it away, and oh. I lost it. I'm like, come on, man. Like That was my, that was my memorabilia. That Lane Kiffin, I got to meet Lane Kiffin. Because Lane played in Minnesota, Bloomington Kennedy. I'm from Minnesota, so I knew of Lane. We're similar in age. Well, you know, he's born in Lincoln. Yes, that, yeah, born in Lincoln, yeah. but then his dad was with the Minnesota Vikings, uh, and so he played football at Bloomington Kennedy High School in, in the Twin Cities. Do you have any head coaches you don't like? I, I know you probably can't name, but would they come in and you're like, really? Um, yes, there's a couple <laughs> that were. Any, anybody no longer coaching that you're like, oh my God, that guy was so hard to work with? So not so much hard to work with, but... Uh, um, Charlie Weiss was There's a shock. probably the most awkward. Like the dude came in with flip flops on, no socks. Uh, you know the way his body is, anyways, right? Because <laughs> um, he ended up signing a player, but I was like, okay. I had Art Bryles in Art. Art, Art the the most intimidating thing for me was in two thousand and it would have been. Gosh, what year was that? Maybe 14. Art Bryles sits in my QB meeting in the back. And I'm going through. I'm like, okay, hopefully I'm saying the right stuff. Do you look at that as a job interview too? I mean, Oh, it is. Yeah. And that's, so I've always said that. I think over 18 years of being a junior college coach, 15 here at Iowa Western, every place I go to visit, it's really a job interview. You know, um, I met Matt Campbell and he's at Toledo. And he was the first head coach that came into us to our school and recruited, like evaluated. I went home to my to my wife that night and I said, if there I could work for that guy. He's the most genuine. Like, I mean, he's a head coach in the Mac. I don't care what level it is. He came and eval watch practice. It wasn't like he sent his assistants to get prospects and then him to come in and recruit. He recruited it, you know. Um, so, I mean, it's it's been, gosh, uh, unbelievable with the amount of connections and the, the friendships that we have now, you know, with the four-year coaches. Um, you're a quarterback's coach. You run a spread offense, correct? Yep. Do you ever – do you feel you, you would ever change? Do you try to – I mean – if something changes, if the wind blows and in, in offensive styles, how do you do that for, for guys that come in that are looking for a particular style of, of football? The thing, the thing for me, what I've always done, and we've sent in 14 years, I think I've sent 18 guys, 17 or 18 quarterbacks on division one. Some years, my starter and my backup at the end of the day, I think what coaches get caught up in, you have your base system. Now for you, it's different because you can recruit it a little bit differently. I have to, what I try to do is I try to see the game the way the quarterback sees the game. So in meetings, like my first, I'm asking them questions and these guys are all worried, like they give the wrong answer. All I'm trying to do is figure out how they see the game. They don't all see it the way I see it. So I got to find out how they see the game, number one. Number two, I got to find out in a month what their strengths are. I mean, Jake, Jake Waters was the ultimate probably – dual threat guy that you all want, right? I had Zach Stout, who was a true pocket passer, vertical game, big time arm. Kai Loxley was a runner, threw it down the field, wasn't extremely accurate. You know, Nate Glantz was, he was all over the place, just a competitor, right? So you have to find that all our offenses have changed. This year, shoot, the um, the guy who won our semifinal game and our national championship game, he played at Georgia Tech in 
as a quarterback in, he was recruited Alabama as a corner, just an athlete, right? Not a great thrower. He comes in here as a wide receiver. All of a sudden, my starter goes down. My backup gets a concussion. I got to play James Graham. James Graham won us a semifinal and a national championship game, and he was a wide receiver. Now, we threw the ball <laughs> 10 times in the national championship game. James Graham ran for 117 yards. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to change it a little bit based yeah. on your guy. And we had enough time in the prep of, you know, two weeks before the semifinal and then seven game, seven days before. And he took every rep. He was the only quarterback if in the semifinal game. If he went down, I didn't have a quarterback to play. Wow. How do you recruit? What I mean, is there kind of a big picture thing that you go out? Is it... Are you recruiting need based? Are you recruiting? I, I need guys that I can develop and send on to other schools. Yeah. How, what What's your base philosophy when it comes? So to it's that? funny because whenever I get a new coach from like a four year school, they're like, "What are our needs this year?" I said, "Every position," because we never know. Like I just lose Ashton Barkler to to Florida State. I can't replace Ashton Barker. T- you know in may yeah the time the time frame that you have to deal with so is, you half, better, is half the time you better protect yourself but you i have an idea of like hey i could lose this guy I better protect myself a little bit right so really it started i mean now with all my the relationships that you built over the years not with four-year schools but with high school high school coaches and how we you know develop kids and and treat them right and get them on to the next level. I get a lot from the high school coaches. Like I don't, we don't go to Florida. We recruit Florida though, but it's all coaches that I know that have sent a kid to me that I've taken care of and I've sent them on and they'll call me when they got a kid. Perfect example is Tom Wilson at Dowling Catholic. Pretty good coach. Pretty good program. Seven straight national or high school state championships, right? I've had 15 Dowling players come to me that went Division One, And it started when I was at Nyack, and I had a kicker, okay? That was, he was our kicker from, from Dowling. And my brother started the relationship. He was a coach with me, and he recruited Des Moines. But <clears throat> I left to come here, and I got um, him a scholarship. To, while he was still at Nyack, I got him a scholarship to Elkhorn State. From that day forward... I'm getting the Dowling kids that I want. So you mentioned the Iowa high schools, but you can recruit in border states now. Yep. So you've had some Bellevue West players. Yep. So where, where is your biggest I – mean, how, how's the relationship with the Omaha and, let's say, eastern Nebraska high school coaches? So the crazy part is uh, Huffman at Bell West, <laughs> when he was at uh, – was Burke, Millard West. The smaller school north of north before he went to maybe – Oh, was he at uh... – Roncalli? No. Wasn't Roncalli? But anyways, he, wherever he was at that small school, we had a coaching clinic. He brought his staff the first day. The next day we came back and none, none of the coaches came back for spring ball except for his staff. He said, and I get here, go to our position meetings, go do this, do that. And they run a lot of the same stuff still today that he got from those clinics. But so it's a relationship there, but Aaron Terry, my D line coach, played at Omaha North. Okay, has a really, really good relationship with all of them. One of the first coaches I met over there was Larry Martin. Uh-huh. Larry's been unbelievable for me. Right, we've had so many. Uh, Larry's Omaha a North. hell of a coach. Yeah, yes, unbelievable coach. Right, my son wrestled against Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think my son's senior year. I think his senior year, he was he was a state medalist in wrestling. I think he had, I think it was like eight eight or nine losses his senior year. Five were to Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> this is Aaron's yeah. nephew. Yeah. Yeah. It was just one of those like, son of a bitch. Yeah. No, he's good. And Tyson's a great kid. He's, no, he is. He is. He's, so. a, he's a great kid. But So you have that relationship with Omaha yes. as well. Yeah, I mean, now it started off, and there was a coach, like I said earlier, um, there was a when I it might have been like 2009. I won't. The coach isn't coaching anymore in in Omaha, but there was a he had a fullback, best player on the t- on his team. I told him, I'm like, coach, I'm gonna be honest with you, like I don't use a fullback. Like he's not gonna play for me. 
So he went to a Minnesota junior college. The next year I go into the same school, I'm recruiting a D end who ends up going to division two and getting a chance in the NFL. And he's like, coach, why would I like, or why would I send him there when he wasn't even as good as the last guy? So there was some, it took a little while. Okay. Yeah. You know, and then there was one, we had Travis Green from Omaha North who they said, you know what, it might be best for him to leave Omaha. I respect that. He went to Dodge City. I told Travis, I'm like, you you wear cowboy boots and cowboy hat? He's like, no. I said, well, that's what you're going to wear out there, right? (laughs) So he was there for one semester, (laughs) transferred back, came here and ended up signing with K-State and then grad transferred, I think, to like Florida Atlantic, or now he's a police officer in, in uh, Boca Raton. I, I know you get players from all around. You mentioned you get Florida, and, most, and a lot of your players got to be from Iowa or, or the border states. If you were only to recruit Iowa and eastern Nebraska, could you still be competitive where you're at? Absolutely. Th- that's how good a football is. No, it, it is. I think the biggest thing is, is there's a couple times, or some years where skill-wise, you know, like uh, you know that, that big-time water. But, I mean... We've had some, there's some big time wide receivers that have come out of Nebraska in the last, you know, few years too. When I first started, when I was at Nyack, that's when I started. I don't know, Marquise Parker from Omaha West Side, Yano Jones' his nephew. Yeah. Yeah. I recruited him there, right? <clears throat> and uh, then I ended up leaving or whatever. That's how I met my buddy who was at TCU. He's now at uh, um, Texas San Antonio. But, anyways, he's Marquise Parker. That's kind of where it started. There was a little lull there, though where I didn't think the quality of high school players was as good, but now it's, I mean, it's phenomenal right now. What's the reason for that? I, I asked that question. This is, I'd ask this of any guy coaching college football because it's one of those things where, I don't know, it's probably about eight or 10 years ago, the World Herald had like a multi-part article on the dearth of college athletes coming out of Nebraska. You can't go anywhere in the state now without tripping over D1 kids. A, I, I do think the coaching, and I, I, I'm i not trying to knock any of the other, other coaches right in that time, but I think the coaching is extremely good. Okay, They have more coaches now probably than they've ever had. I think the development, the strength and conditioning, the, the, the summer opportunities to do things, I think is big. I do. Um, and then, like I said, it go it goes in stretches, but uh, it's been it's been pretty darn good. It's it's interesting. You mentioned Mike Huffman, and he's kind of a. So my kids went to West Side. My son played football for West Side. Yep. Um, got a couple nice wins over Huffman. Yep. Got one really ugly loss in a state title game to Huffman. <laughs> uh, he's one of these guys that like he's a little polarizing here in Omaha. I mean, he's kind of one of these guys you kind of love him or hate him. <laughs> yeah. And I've always looked at I've I've always looked at Coach Huffman in the sense that when I look at him from a parent standpoint, here's this guy. I, I would say Huffman probably works harder than almost any other coach in the area to get kids to the next level. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what level it is, whether it's NAIA, junior college, D2, whatever, he's out there working. It seems like he's out there working his tail off to get kids to the next level. I would think when it comes to this building relationship standpoint, you touched on that visit that he had with you. And I guess in my mind, that doesn't surprise me when I look at what he's done at Bellevue West, because everybody looks at the D1 kids that come out of Bellevue West, man, he's shipping kids everywhere at all levels. I mean, you go with with my, with my son when we were doing all of these NAIA and D2 visits, every place we went, there was a couple of Bell West kids visiting the same yeah. time. I mean, yeah. just he's sending kids everywhere. Yeah, you know, and I think now I still do with – some coaches that it's hard to get a to get a hold of them or get their prospect lists or things like that at the I, high school level. Yeah, so then they're not doing their kids a service. No, see, I think that's an absolute crime in my book. So exactly. You, you're not fit to be. You're not fit to be a high school coach if you're not. Doing yeah, it. and I hate to say it's. Hey, this is part of your job. Yep. Quotation marks. 
That, but I think it kind of is. It is. I mean, if you're a high school teacher, if you're a high school coach, your job's not to get kids. I just need to get them to graduation. It's like, no, you're here to get these kids to whatever they're going to Especially go Especially if they want to go to the next level. I don't care if they're going to Metro for welding. Metro's got an awesome welding program. Develop those kids and get them to the point where they can go to Metro. Or Iowa Western. Or Iowa Western. <laughs> Metro is no football, so you're yeah. safe there. Um, but that's my idea. Is like If you're a high school teacher or coach, your job should be to try and get these kids to whatever they're going to go on to next in life well and i think so and the reason you're seeing way more you get some coaches that are and and the create so when uh the guy went to from bell west went to oklahoma um just recently but huffman would text me he's like hey you have lincoln riley's number you know so he's he's reaching out to some guys because he's got some prospects and they're going to these camps and things he's like trying that. he is i think with the lack of success the last how many years from like Nebraska hat, you know, I mean, because in the past, so go back how, however many years. So Larry Martin calls me, he's got an old lineman and he's really good. Like, but at that time, Nebraska wasn't really talking to him too much or doing anything, right? So Michigan State calls me and I'm like, it's Brad Salem, he's now at Memphis, but I go, there's a really good one at Omaha North. Like you got to take a look. Cause he was asking me, he's like, coach, but we're, we're going to spend all this time recruiting him." and Nebraska offers him. He's going to Nebraska. So that was the, that was kind of the thought process from all these outside, which schools. I do see. I mean, yeah. I get yes, that. Cause yeah. I've, so they didn't want to waste all a whole bunch of resources and, and time and effort on it. So if Michigan state offers them, then maybe Nebraska comes in, offers them and then it's done deal. Here's a question for you. Do you think that is a real dynamic still to this day? Because I look at the number of kids out yeah. of Omaha who have, well, Eastern Nebraska in general, who have gone to other schools, yeah. who have gone to Kansas State. I mean, look at Keegan Johnson, yeah. for instance. Goes to Iowa, yeah. now at Kansas State. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's completely bypassed Nebraska twice. And, and I think some of that is you look at Chris Kleiman, and Connor Riley, who's there, who's yeah, and I know Connor pretty who's, well. Who's a Nebraska guy yeah. has a lot of ties. Remember when Dan Jackson was up at South Dakota State? Yeah, and they, they he's an old clean, Burt kid. Cleaned house in Nebraska, but and that was when the walk-ons were like the yeah. Walk-on well, and Dan's were. gotten. I mean, Dan had a he had a pipeline to Northern Illinois there yes, for a yes, while. Yeah. I mean, still, I mean, there was about three or four really, really yeah. good kids who, in yep. my opinion, would currently be starters down in Lincoln. Starters. The, 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 We're it, playing for Northern yeah. Illinois right now because of Dan Jackson, who's now at Vanderbilt. Yep. And he's and he's now pulling Nebraska kids yeah, to Vanderbilt. He's, he's you got to have a 35 ACT, but he's pulling <laughs> Nebraska kids to Vanderbilt. That, that is so true. I mean, getting into Vanderbilt is not the same as getting into Nebraska, right? I mean, that's... There's some truth to that. There's, there's but truth I think there. once you see a couple kids that went out and were a little bit successful, then and and again today, today's kid is it's a lot of glamour. It's a lot of I like the recruiting process. Uh, you know, Oklahoma in the Jumpman jerseys and made the playoffs. A couple, you know, which I mean? hell I I liked it back in 1988. So I mean, it's like I I get that. Do Do you think that dynamic has changed though locally, in your opinion? Where now it's one of those, hey, Nebraska's offered, but so is Auburn. Nebraska's yeah. offered, but so is Michigan State. Nebraska's offered, but so is TCU. Yes. Yeah, I do. And, and I think just because kids, they grow up, well. I, got, I mean, if Nebraska was winning yeah. 10, 10 or 11 games a year, that changes yeah. stuff. But, I mean, anybody who's winning, it changes that dynamic. Yeah. But I, you think that local thing has changed. I, I do. I, I just think kids now, because even for some of our guys, so the the like they they hear, if they turn on the radio, they hear, Nebraska football talk. They turn on the news station, they hear Nebraska. So it's all, but then they don't hear about Auburn. Like even my D tackle, who's going to Auburn, um, like, well, I, Perry and Winfrey, I tried to say like, dude, you're going to Nebraska. You know what I mean? But he goes to Oklahoma. They just played in the, in the playoff and, 
uh, Jalen Hurts has just won the high or whoever won the Heisman that year from Oklahoma or whatever. So, and it was a tough deal, but I tried to, you know, push them. Um, but they hear everything they see, they, they see everything about Nebraska right now and they were struggling. Right. So they hear a lot of the negative. And so some kids are looking to go, you know, does the portal hurt Juco football? It, it, it did. So, <clears throat> Well, it hurt from a standpoint of getting a kid who's transferring from a four-year school because now they can transfer. Before, if you're a Division One player and you want to transfer, in order to play Division One, you have to drop down. So then they'd go JUCO for a year and then they'd transfer back to Division One. Well, now they don't have to do that. So, but what it's done is it's given us a better high school kid. Okay. Because they're not recruiting as many high school kids. So a kid that might have been um, you know, on the border of an FCS or Division One, where they would have looked at that kid as we're still taking him, yep. but we know he's a developmental yep. project. And where it hurt was, um, like they're they're recruiting our guys, so, so coaches would come in and they'd be like, "I don't know if we're going to take a JUCO kid. We're going to wait for a Portal kid." Where before it was, we're taking a JUCO kid at quarterback. Nate Glantz, perfect perfect example. Nate had some group of fives and he's going to commit to a school. They, he calls them to commit. They call him or they tell him we just took a portal kid two days before. So now we're, we have nothing, right? So we're scrambling around. we got some FCS. He wants to play power five. We get him to, to walk on at Iowa state. Doesn't work out there. Now he's at McNeese state and he's going to be really good there. But he, he was a pro project of, of, the portal hurting a junior college kid. Jacob Ells, defense player of the year in uh, 2021, he had he was going to go to Indiana State. If he would have been a player in 2019, he would have had 25 offers. He got one from Iowa State right the day before signing day. He went up there, visited, or before second semester started, visited, committed, stayed there, Mom and dad brought us, or mom brought us stuff up to Iowa State. Wow. One power five offer. And that was part of relationships and, and me selling them, you know, over yeah. and over. But he would have had, like I said, it, that year we'd had guys with multiple power five offers. So the portal has been a thorn in the side. And, and I get it. How about NIL? Do you got to play the NIL game now? <laughs> I don't. I hope it never gets to us. To be honest with you, well, it's a fair question because it's in high school. It's in high schools. It's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, I'm sure there's there's maybe very few junior colleges that could do anything. Now you get some supporters, and there, you know, there's, you know, I give this guy a meal once a week, and he'll put out on social media. You know, might be able to do something like that. But as far as money, but I think the big thing there. And, and this is why my theory is why you're seeing all these division one coaches go to the NFL assistants and is the days of building a relationship with a kid and to getting them and selling mom or dad or both that I'm going to take care of your kid where we had the power. We don't have the power no more. The kids have the power because I mean, I know a lot of division one coaches that they're recruiting a kid. And the first question out of the recruit's mouth, how much can you give me? And that's the kickers. And I mean, it, it completely, the that building the relationship thing's gone. Yep. It's now, I mean. Because, and here's the problem. Look is at that Creighton you, basketball. Right, well, 100%. Yeah. But you're, you're, you, you got kids making half a million dollars leaving to go make three quarters of a because million dollars. Because rightfully or wrongfully, I don't even know if that's I'm grammatically sure correct. Them, but. No, but grammatically that was probably incorrect. But the relationship, and I don't know if Trev Alberts and Matt Rule like this, has to be built with Matt Davison because he he has the check he has the checkbook. Think about that. That's where the checkbook is. Because if they go to Matt Rule, how much are you going to pay me? Matt has to say, uh, here's the collective. You have to I mean, technically that's the way it's supposed to take yeah. place. You have to say, call this guy. Because I can't I can't talk to you about that. What? Which is why when Doug Ewald was here, I I, I mean all this has to go in house. If it doesn't go in house, it's going to be a clusterfuck for a long time to come. Well, the the crazy thing is, so the so I I serve uh, as the junior college rep on the AFCA board of trustees. So I'm in there with all these 
Pat Fitzgerald, David Shaw's, the Sam Pittman's, the, I mean, there's a whole bunch of division one coaches in there. And I, I get to speak from a junior college of where junior college and the concerns we have, but the biggest thing there is they're trying to, well, first of all, we, they all knew this was coming. The NCAA, they never expected to drop transfer portal and NIL at the same time. They were thinking one go first, then the other one was going to come, but then all of a sudden, bang, it went both at the same time. It's a complete disaster. And they, all the coaches know it too. So the two parts of it is the, the NIL and then the collectives. So a lot of schools I know, they say, here's what we give our student athletes in NIL. It's going to be $20,000 a year, whatever it is, 5,000 a month. What they didn't the what they didn't know is how much tampering was going to go on and how much of the collectives of outside people writing a check to you and it's not illegal. So that's where they, they want to make it transparent, which coaches don't want that because here's the concern that they're having already. I'm entering the portal, I'm playing, he's on more money than me. So I'm leaving. You're going to see it. Well, it's, it's, but, the, the, but you know, the like, welcome to, welcome got, to the I mean, real world, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> and you and I have talked about this, that, I mean, it's one of those, there's this line of communication that technically according to the rules is not supposed to be happening, yes. yep. but then you're looking at a kid transferring and you're like, well, it's not like the kid just hopped on like like walked over to a wall map threw a dart hit auburn and went like oh i guess i'll go go to auburn no there had to have been a line of communication there i'm in the i'm in that meeting yeah somebody somebody's talking to somebody you know what's happening i mean uh, the officially no but you know what's happening wake forest i think is going to notre dame and the coach was like he came in my office says he's entering the portal and three hours later, he committed to a school. You can't tell me that there wasn't communication. Yeah, there had prior, to been. You know what I mean? And that's where they, that's the thing they have to stop. There's, there's got to be some type of violation, but the NCAA isn't going to do it. You know what I mean? They're, now it's just, you can't get into it. The, the other thing I guess I would say is either that or you, you, you pull all the brakes off and allow it. Well, you almost have to, right? Or you I mean, have a process, have a dedicated process. You can have those conversations, but have some process that has to go through this step, this step, and this step, and they can talk. But You would be surprised at how many coaches have called me on my players that have went to a group of five and done well to see if I would contact them if they would transfer. Or enter the portal. So the really, so the tampering's there. Oh I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you have players that who who see dollar signs now, and the first thing they ask a coach is how much you're paying me? So, the, I I don't I don't, and and I have I do have I know one for sure um, that got some nil money, um, and I'm sure some of the other ones will get some, but it was never the thing. My guys, they want a good, they want a Division One scholarship. So, and there's Division One coaches that have told me he's like we're going juco because i'm sick of chasing the portal kid that all they wanted is money and i can go get a really good junior college kid now that just wants a chance to play division one football if he gets nil then later that's awesome but he's not asking for the collective part of it that's interesting you have placed 58 linemen in division one football the last six seasons you have none to nebraska none to nebraska you have a uh, you have football camp coming out. Hogs and dogs is that what it's called? Yeah. So we do that with O line D lineman for the Midwest, and we've done a really good job. You had to bring him over there and help. Exactly. I need to know. We need to know. Like I had no idea this existed. Hogs and dogs. Yeah. I mean, he's a pretty good why guy to bring in. Not, yeah. Why are we'll we not to. promoting this? Uh, well, we are right now. <laughs> we do a really good job in Iowa, Nebraska. Because okay. I follow Missouri. Aaron on Twitter, and Air, I'm I'm telling you. I don't know he, why I missed this. He's but. as good of a D line coach as I've ever better. I mean, he he's got those guys. Uh, he churned some dudes out. The thing, the best part about him in the recruiting process, like he knows what he wants, and it's not he's got to be six five. He's got to be this. He don't care. He if if we watch the film and he fits our scheme, 
he's going to coach the heck out of them. And they fundamentally are. We sent eight D linemen Division One this year. Eight. That's insane. Zero two. <laughs> Nebraska. Okay. Eight defensive linemen in one year going to Division One schools out of Iowa Western. Yeah. If you're listening to the podcast and you want to play college football, you might, and you're a lineman, you might want well, to look at Iowa. And, and, and let me say this, Coach, do you have Division One coaches come in and go, this is bullshit because your your facilities are better than their own? I mean, I, I need Google Iowa Western indoor football facility, and I think – most Division One football coaches would be jealous of what you have. <laughs> it's a nice – you drive by that campus. I, I it's a nice campus. So Bob, Bob Davey, who was at, he was at New Mexico. New Mexico State. New Mexico State. And or was it New Mexico? It was New Mexico. New Mexico, yeah. So he came in there recruiting some of our guys, and and one of my coaches kind of showed him around a little bit. He came up my office. He's like, Coach, I'm just going to let you. I'll probably never be able to recruit Iowa Western ever again. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like – your facilities are better than ours. <laughs> and I and to be honest with you, there's sometimes when when we didn't have these facilities and I'd bring a kid in from a big time high school, it's kind of the same thing. Like you have better at your high school than we have, type of thing. Scott, when he came in, he said our locker room was better than the UCF's. Wow. Wow. I've never been on campus to, I, I've seen I got out of television. Maybe Rob and I come over there some, some afternoon. Will you give us a tour? Absolutely. You want to go over there some afternoon? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean that'd be that'd be really cool because I think people see East Mississippi had decent field, but their dorms and stuff. Then when Jason Brown, we haven't got to Jason Brown yet at Independence <laughs> on that last chance. You those were horrible facilities. Yeah. What was that guy like? Oh my gosh! What you see, that's him. Do you like him or not like him? Because you guys had a confrontation no on on camera, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Here, here's my thing, like, because last chance you wanted to come to us. And I'm like, there's not enough drama. And they came the second season at Independence. And that's a good thing, what you just said right yes. there. <laughs> no drama. <laughs> so, but here's the deal. You crap get, makes for crap TV. <laughs> yes. They get access from 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night with whatever players they want in the dorms or whatever, right? So... They're at our practice. They dropped They dropped everything, moved everything here when Independence was coming here. I said, here's the deal. You can interview these players. I prepped all our players. Even during that time, I still had one guy come in and be a knucklehead in, in a meeting, right? He walks in and he makes some comments because he knew, my players knew, I prepped them. But I'm down at practice. Every time I was talking to a player, I had a microphone over my head and a camera in my face. Right. So if something, if you're going to, and I'm self-conscious anyways, like I don't want that on TV. Right. And I coach, we coach them hard, but if I have a camera in my face, I'm going to change my tone a little bit. Yeah. You've loosened up here, by the way, in the last hour. Maybe it's the beer you're drinking. I don't know. <laughs> now, what is the ABV on that stuff? Uh, by the way, we're drinking some Terrapin. The coach and I are drinking Terrapin white chocolate Moohoo. It's a milk stout. Uh, I don't know what the ABV is. Which, uh, six point one. This is a, this is from our man Craig in Atlanta. In Atlanta, we get people Craig, that drive us beer. Craig, so, Craig Craig hooks us up big time. Crazy story. I had a guy. Uh, he was driving through Mississippi in two thousand and it would have been seventeen or eighteen when we were we were eleven and or eleven and one or ten and one number one in the country. We win and we drop to number three. But he stops in Mississippi and he buys a six pack of JUCO beer. Juco. Ju- it's called Juco beer. <clears throat> then he goes, puts it in, he's like, you cannot drink until you win a national championship, right? Okay. So we get knocked out of that one. We don't get to play for it. So, And then we lose last year. Yes. So this year, I have a coach that brings it down with us and we win it. And we had to drink the Juco beer. It was the most disgusting <laughs> Look, you guys are going through. I'm like, I'm like looking this up. So I'm like, I, I, de- I derailed you, but you had a you had a camera in your face. Did you have to sign off or agree to that? Because you, you could have said you're not coming here. Yeah, and and I gave them limitations. Okay. That. But the, the other thing off of that is okay. So we're out there practicing, and I got a bunch of scout team guys over on the sidelines. Right, we're doing a walkthrough on Friday, and I'm just paranoid because I look over and there's cameras 
and microphones on about eight or 10 guys and they're, you know, doing whatever they're doing. I'm just like, Oh boy, dude, please don't put this on last chance. You, I was nervous when I watched this show, <laughs> I was like, what is going to go on here? <clears throat> but, um, yeah, well then he ended up getting ejected that game against us. That's right. Cause that was at Lewis central, right? Yeah. 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 Wow. There it is. Juco, oh, there it is. Out of Birmingham, Good People Brewing Company out of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Southern IPA. Now, it was summer seasonal. Now, it was also probably, you know. Three sheets might, to the wind by then? It might have passed the, or <laughs> not passed the, the date. Uh, what do they call it? The, <laughs> oh, the born on date? <laughs> yeah, the born on date. It, it, it was not. It, it was the old Keystone bitter beer face. The, <laughs> the crazy thing about that, I was. With Especially day, line can. <laughs> the day before we left. I felt the sickness coming on. Oh shit! I was sick, and I so I said after because in twelve we won it. I had a team meeting on Monday. I went on the road recruiting Tuesday. I said we. I ever it's been ten years. If I ever win it again, we're we're enjoying this, right? I was sick, shivering, dehydrated during that game. After the game, I couldn't talk. Anytime I talked, I was coughing, and uh, I ended up I I ended up going. I had one shot of tequila. And then I went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Tequila cures all, doesn't it? Dude, it clears the throat. It's a hot toddy. It's good for the cough. Man, that is that is good, good stuff. So the Hogs and Dogs football camp, uh, just go to the Iowa Western page. You can find out more about it. Are you still taking people for that? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. You need to help out with that. You have a, you have just all this wisdom. I've got some. Got hit Plus, you're a big a dude. You play in the National Football League. But we do. We need to make a trek to uh, Council Has, Bluffs. Hasman once was to, but yeah to go look at the the facilities. I, yeah, you know, that would say. be cool. So, glad you came over, Coach. The basement wasn't that intimidating, was it? No, it wasn't. I, that's this is. We'll good. give I, you beer. Yeah, we yeah, we exactly. we drank beer. We talked football. This might be the most football we've talked in a long time on this podcast. It's probably the most strictly football yeah. we've discussed. But it's still amazing. Which the to crazy me. thing is, we still managed to work portal and nil <laughs> into the discussion. <laughs> But again, if you're tuning in late, which hopefully you're not, uh, Iowa Western has won two national titles, has placed over close to 400 Division One players, almost 100 Power Five, and zero have gone to Nebraska. Which the ironic part Fuck is, you. going back to 2008, God, that's, that's still mind blowing. Tom numbers. Osborne was a key consultant in getting Iowa Western football started, and I remember that got publicized kind of heavily in Lincoln and Omaha. The, the Osborne aspect to this. However big a role he played or didn't play, it got publicized that yeah. way. That, that was the perception is that Coach Osborne's going to at least help this get rolling. And still to this day, zero. I have a little zero. <clears throat> theory on... So Bo Pelini, you know Bo, hard-headed, that... He heard all this talk that here's the pipeline, here's the pipeline, that he is almost like, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> you you can't tell me to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Hey, folks, uh, if you are into betting, which, uh, well, some of us are, make sure to download the Betfred Sports app on the Apple and Google Play stores. Uh, find out why everybody is talking about betting with Fred. And uh, right now, when you place your first wager with Betfred of $50 or more, you'll immediately get $111 in Fred bets and 50% back on your losses up to $200 weekly for the first five weeks of betting with Fred. Go to BetfredSports.com. You know where you can bet at with Betfred Sports yeah, app? In Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, in I- you can't Iowa. do it in Nebraska, but you got to do it in Iowa. You can do it in Iowa. And all you do is cross the bridge. It's, it's that simple. Or go simple. to Trav Strip Club. That's well, because... Because the Spearmint Rhino runs halfway. I, I know. Not that I go in the Spearmint Rhino. I'm just saying half the parking sure, lot yeah. is in Iowa. Just, I'm just and saying I'm just that. Playboy for the article. Uh, also, uh, if you need a lawyer, call our good friend uh, Connor Orr at Orr and Horrigan, an Omaha law firm. He's uh, he's a sports agent. He's a litigator. Uh, he can do it all. We need to get Connor back in here to talk some NIL because it's talk been a, a while. Jasker, right? yeah, yeah. He is a Jasker. He is a Jasker, but he's also an NIL guy. So go to OrrHorrigan.com. Coach Scott Strohmeyer, thank you so much for your time. It was a blast. Uh, We're going to go over there and check out the facilities. If you want to watch Reaver football this fall, uh, they play their home games at uh, at Lewis Central. And again, they produce Division I talent like there's no other. So 58 linemen to Division I schools. In the last six years. 
Maybe go check out the uh, Hogs and Dogs camp coming up. That's right. Uh, for Dr. Rob Zadis, for Co- Coach uh, Scott Stromar, I'm Travis Justice. We'll talk to you next time on the Doc Talk Podcast presented by Betfred Sports. Sports.